Hello and welcome back. In this video lecture, we are going to study about the physiological aspect of autonomic nervous system. We will cover this topic under these three headings. Autonomic neurotransmitters, receptors of the neurotransmitters and effect of autonomic nerve impulses on effector organs. So coming to the first topic is the neurotransmitters. As we have studied in the previous class that autonomic nervous system consists of let it be the sympathetic division or the parasympathetic division it consists of a preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron. To conduct these action potential or the nerve impulse they secrete a certain kind of neurotransmitters and the knowledge of those neurotransmitters is important if we have to use the knowledge for the pharmacological purposes or the for the purpose of treatment or as a drug for any disease so let us see what are the type of neurotransmitters basically there are two main type of neurotransmitters which can be present in the autonomic nervous system that is first main type is acetylcholine acetylcholine is the first type of neurotransmitter which is present in the autonomic nervous system and the second main type of neurotransmitter is noradrenaline or norepinephrine and epinephrine majorly the neurotransmitters which is secreted among these norepinephrine and epinephrine is norepinephrine or noradrenaline so the two types of neurotransmitters are acetylcholine and noradrenaline or norepinephrine any neuron which will be secreting acetylcholine will be called as cholinergic neuron and any neuron which will be secreting noradrenaline as its neurotransmitter will be called as adrenergic neuron so let us see what are the neurotransmitter used by various divisions of our autonomic nervous system as we can see here the parasympathetic division of autonomic nervous system there are preganglionic neurons which is the preganglionic neuron as we have studied which is coming from the craniosacral outflow this preganglionic neuron is a cholinergic neuron why it is a cholinergic neuron because it secretes acetylcholine in the ganglia to transmit its impulse to the postganglionic neurons so parasympathetic preganglionic neuron is a cholinergic neuron which secretes acetylcholine coming to the parasympathetic postganglionic neuron it also secretes acetylcholine and that is why it is also a cholinergic neuron so as you can see parasympathetic preganglionic neuron is a cholinergic neuron which secretes acetylcholine as well as the postganglionic fibers are also cholinergic neurons which secretes acetylcholine now coming to the sympathetic preganglionic neurons so the sympathetic preganglionic neurons are also secreting acetylcholine and are called as the cholinergic neurons so the preganglionic neurons are secreting acetylcholine whereas on the basis of what the postganglionic neuron are secreting it can be called as either adrenergic neuron splanchnic neuron or cholinergic neuron that means the sympathetic preganglionic neuron will always secrete acetylcholine but the postganglionic neuron can secrete three different things there are three different possibilities and on the basis of these possibilities the sympathetic fibers or the sympathetic division is divided under adrenergic splanchnic and cholinergic division any sympathetic division in which the postganglionic neurons is secreting noradrenaline the postganglionic neuron which is secreting noradrenaline will be called as adrenergic sympathetic neuron the division in which the postganglionic neuron role is played by adrenal medulla will be called as a splanchnic neuron 
whereas in the third case if the post ganglionic neuron is secreting acetylcholine it will be called as sympathetic cholinergic neuron so as we can see here parasympathetic as well as sympathetic the preganglionic neurons all of them secretes acetylcholine whereas the parasympathetic post ganglionic fiber have acetylcholine sympathetic adrenergic fibers have noradrenaline sympathetic splanchnic fibers renal medulla act as a post ganglionic neuron and it secretes the adrenaline and noradrenaline directly into the blood and then the sympathetic cholinergic fibers which in which the post ganglionic neuron secretes acetylcholine let us study in detail a little bit about these neurotransmitters acetylcholine as well as norepinephrine they are synthesized in the terminal buttons of the neuron they are not synthesized they are the small neurotransmitters and for their synthesis it is not necessary that it should be synthesized in the cell body of the neuron these neurotransmitters are small neurotransmitters and synthesized with the help of enzymes at the terminal button of the neuron itself so let us see acetylcholine acetylcholine is synthesized with the help of acetyl coenzyme a and choline and in the presence of enzyme choline acetyl transferase it becomes acetylcholine then it is stored in the vesicles and whenever the acet uh, whenever the action potential comes as you know the process the calcium ion uh, the voltage gated calcium channel opens the calcium ion comes inside which then initiates the process of a uh, fusion of those vesicles with the presynaptic membrane and then the neurotransmitters are released after the release they acts for few seconds and after that these acetylcholine molecules are then degraded by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase this acetylcholine esterase is very important as it is used as a pharmacological agent either to increase or to decrease the action of acetylcholine in the places or in the case of parasympathetic autonomic nervous system now coming to the norepinephrine norepinephrine is also secreted in the terminal buttons with the tyrosine molecule the hydroxylation of tyrosine molecule gives dopa decarboxylation of dopa gives dopamine and then the transport of dopamine occurs inside the vesicles and inside the vesicles dopamine's hydroxylation gives norepinephrine if norepinephrine gives gets methylated it becomes epinephrine after the norepinephrine is secreted into the nerve ending it acts there for few seconds and then it is 80% of it 50 to 80% of it is reuptake or it is taken back by the nerve terminal rest of it it's either degraded by the enzymes the enzymes are monoamine oxidase or catechol o methyl transferase so these are the enzymes which degrades the norepinephrine the remaining norepinephrine in the nerve terminal now coming to the autonomic receptors these receptors are the protein molecule which are present on the surface of either the post ganglionic neuron or on the surface of the effector organ which lies close to the nerve endings which secretes the neurotransmitters so basically the neurotransmitters are going to act on the protein molecules receptors and then these receptors can convey the message or impulse from these neurons to the effector organs how does they convey this message there are two possibilities either these receptors are the ion channels that means whenever the neurotransmitter comes and combines to these receptors they open the ion channels or they allow some ions to pass through if it is allowing the positive ions to come inside the cell it will excite or it will stimulate the cell if it is allowing the negative ion like 
chloride ion to come inside the cell it will be inhibiting its action so based on which ion it allows it will either stimulate or inhibit the action of the effector organ or the forward neurons these type of receptors which are ion channels or which directly open on the combination of neurotransmitter directly opens the ion channels which are present in their body itself body of the receptor itself are called ionotropic receptors whereas there is a second type of receptors which on the combination with neurotransmitters activates the second messenger system and then evokes a cell response that is a, either a membrane response or a biochemical cascade or regulation of gene expression <clears throat> if this is a type of receptor which activates the second messenger is present it will be called as a metabotrophic receptor that means it initiates a metabolic enzyme or metabolic second messenger system and that is why if the neurotransmitter acts through this type of receptor these receptors are called metabotrophic trophic receptors one peculiarity about these two different receptors are inotrophic receptors act for a short time itself only active for a short times once it gets activated by the neurotransmitter it acts only for short time whereas the metabotrophic receptors will get activated by the neurotransmitter it its action will be for a prolonged time so as we have seen there are two possibilities either they are inotropic receptors or there are metabotrophic receptors but the autonomic receptors are divided on the basis of which neurotransmitters they are accepting or which neurotransmitters activate them so there are the autonomic receptors are divided into cholinergic receptors which are activated by acetylcholine or adrenergic receptors which are activated by norepinephrine or epinephrine so these are the two main division of autonomic receptors the cholinergic receptors which activates by acetylcholine and the adrenergic receptors which act which activates by the adrenaline or noradrenaline in the other words in or their other name are epinephrine or norepinephrine the cholinergic receptors are further divided into nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors now the nicotinic receptors are the receptors which are present in the junction between the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron as well as it is present in the neuromuscular junction where the acetylcholine is released and it acts on the neuromuscular junction the nicotinic receptors are present and these nicotinic receptors are ionotropic receptors so whenever the acetylcholine combines with the nicotinic receptor what happens an ion channel opens and then it stimulates or it increases the uh, depolarization or it causes hyperpolarization of the membrane with the help of nicotinic receptors whereas the muscarinic receptors are the metabotrophic receptors these muscarinic receptors are present on the end organs like it is present on the heart cardiac muscles it is present on the end organs like in the pupils of the eye the muscles on the pupil the secretory glands and the other end organs which are supplied by cholinergic neurons so muscarinic receptors are the metabotrophic receptors whenever the acetylcholine attaches with the muscarinic re receptor what is going to happen it is going to activate the second messenger system and this second messenger system will then activate a further either it can open an ion channel or it can cause an enzyme to accumulate or it can cause gene expression inside the cell so that is how muscarinic receptor acts now coming to the adrenergic receptors there are two types of adrenergic receptors alpha adrenergic receptors and beta adrenergic receptors the alpha adrenergic receptors are further divided into alpha 1 and alpha 2 subtypes these uses different types of g protein g protein are the proteins g protein coupled receptors and these are the second messenger receptor second messenger system that is why 
the adrenergic receptors both alpha as well as beta are metabotrophic receptors beta adrenergic receptors are also subdivided into beta 1 beta 2 and beta 3 subtypes these alpha or beta subtypes are divided on the basis of action of neurotransmitters the action of norepinephrine is majorly on alpha but it has a minor action on beta receptors that means norepinephrine acts if it is secreted it will activate alpha receptors whereas it will activate very less the beta receptors in the other hand epinephrine or epinephrine will activate both of these alpha as well as beta receptors in the same way so norepinephrine it stimulates the alpha receptors more than beta receptors whereas epinephrine it stimulates both the receptors alpha and beta receptors in the same way there is one synthetic drug called isopropyl norepinephrine that is exclusively acting on the beta receptors excluding the alpha receptors so isopropyl norepinephrine acts exclusively in the beta receptors of the adrenergic receptors which can be then used as a drug to manipulate the sympathetic autonomic nervous system let us see where these alpha and beta receptors are present or what are their actions first of all alpha receptors are majorly the vasoconstrictors that means these are the receptors which are present on the blood vessels and constrict the blood vessels whereas the beta receptors especially beta 2 receptors are vasodilators now one thing we have to understand is the function of alpha of or beta receptor is could be either excitatory or inhibitory on the basis of what types of ion channels they are opening it is not certain that a single type of receptor will act as a stimulatory or inhibitory it can act as both stimulatory or as well as inhibitory based on which type of ion channels they are opening let us say if the alpha receptor is opening the sodium channels allowing the sodium ions to come inside the cell it is stimulatory if they are opening the potassium channel allowing the potassium to go outside of the cell it will act as inhibitory its action will be inhibitory in nature so the alpha and beta receptors are not particularly stimul divided on the basis of stimulatory effect or or inhibitory effect they can have both either stimulatory or inhibitory effects but on the presence on the basis of their presence and on the basis of their actions they are divided functionally in these divisions so alpha causing vasoconstriction usually alpha 1 receptor whereas beta 2 receptors causes vasodilation these alpha 1 and beta 2 are present on the blood vessels then coming to the i alpha receptors causes iris dilation or the dilation of the iris means pupil is dilated then alpha receptor also present in the intestine causing intestinal relaxation we'll study one by one the action of these receptors in each organs just a summary of it is presented here then intestinal sphincter contraction is also done by the alpha receptors pilomotor contraction which causes the hair cells uh, erection of the hair cells is by this alpha receptor bladder sphincter contraction is also caused by the alpha receptors inhibition of neurotransmitter release in the forward neurons is caused by alpha 2 receptors then coming to the cardio acceleration that means the action of sympathetic system to increase the heart rate is done by beta 1 receptors increase myocardial strength is done by beta 1 receptors intestinal relaxation uterus relaxation is caused by the beta 2 receptors bronchodilation that means the dilation of the respiratory passage is caused by the beta 2 receptors Calor cal calorigenesis that means increased production of calories is caused by beta 2 receptor 
glycogenolysis beta 2 receptor lipolysis beta 1 receptors bladder wall relaxation beta 2 receptors thermogenesis beta 3 receptors so as you can see all these receptors are present in various organs various end organs and causing their action when activated so these are the various adrenergic receptors alpha and beta receptors acting on different organs now let us study the effect of these parasympathetic and sympathetic division on individual organs why it is important to remember and understand the effect of parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, supply on individual organs is because these function can be used can be increased or decreased with the help of drug to treat a disorder or treat a disease these drugs are then acting on those receptors and then causing the effect of either increased sympathetic stimulation or decreased sympathetic stimulation or increased parasympathetic stimulation or decreased parasympathetic stimulation to get the resultant output so that we can treat a disorder that is why it is important to understand the effect of each division on individual organs let us start with the eye there are two function of autonomic nervous system in the eye first it controls the size of the pupil in the other words it controls the amount of light which is entering inside the eye the second function is the focus of the lens on the near object or the far object as we can see here the sympathetic system its effect on pupil it is that it dilates the pupil how does it dilate the pupil it the sympathetic supply is to the radial muscles if these radial muscle contracts it will pull the pupil wide open which will cause midriasis or the dilatation of pupil whereas the parasympathetic uh, su division supplies the circular constrictor muscles the circular sphincter or the constrictor muscles if these muscles contract as you can see here there is decrease in the size of pupil which is also called as meiosis or the constriction of the pupil these reflexes are initiated on the basis of light and also called as light reflex if the light is more or if the light is shown on the eye the parasympathetic system activates and it causes the dilate so it co it causes the contraction of the pupil allowing less light to fall on retina so that is how reflexly the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions are activating and acting on the pupil to either dilate or constrict the pupil the second is the control of ciliary muscles now focusing on the object is based on the curvature of the lens if the lens is more convex it focus on the near objects whereas if the lens is flat it focus on the far object the ciliary muscles are supplied more by the parasympathetic division and there is very less effect of sympathetic stimulation so the parasympathetic stimulation causes the constriction of ciliary muscles which causes the lens to become more convex and it helps to focus in the near object or it helps in near vision whereas if the ciliary muscles are relaxed it causes the lens to become flat and to focus on the far vision these are then controlled by the parasympathetic division of your autonomic nervous system now coming to the effect of the sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation on glands as we can see here the nasal lacrimal parotid submandibular gastric and pancreatic glands these glands are supplied by the both sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation what is the effect of sympathetic stimulation is the sympathetic stimulation causes vasoconstriction to the blood supply to these glands first action of sympathetic system is vasoconstriction to the blood supply of these glands and it decreases or it causes the concentrated secretion of these glands or very less amount of secretion rich in enzymes 
of these glands. So the sympathetic stimulation causes vasoconstriction, restricts the blood supply to the gland and causes its secretion to become concentrated and rich in enzymes. Whereas the parasympathetic stimulation causes copious secretion containing watery or copious or watery secretion containing many enzymes. So effect of parasympathetic stimulation in all the glands in are watery secretion and also containing enzymes. So it increases the amount, it increases the water concentration, it increases the enzymes also. As you can see here, the secretion in the GI tract, the autonomic nervous system controls the upper part of the GI tract secretion more and it has very less effect on the secretion of small intestine and large intestine. These secretion on the small intestine and large intestine are mainly on the basis of its reflex activity rather than the autonomic stimulation. So the autonomic parasympathetic and sympathetic system acts majorly on the upper secretion of the upper glands which are the, uh, the salivary glands and the gastric and pancreatic glands but very less on the small secretion of small intestine and large intestine. Now coming to the effect of uh, autonomic nervous system on sweat and apocrine gland. The sweat gland is supplied by the cholinergic type of sympathetic fibers. What is cholinergic type of sympathetic fibers? The cholinergic fibers, the post ganglionic fibers of the auto sympathetic division which secretes acetylcholine instead of adrenaline are called as cholinergic type of fibers. So the sweat gland is the one gland which are supplied by cholinergic fibers of auto sympathetic autonomic nervous system. What does it do? It causes increase in the secretion of the sweat gland. It causes increase in the secretion of the sweat gland. And what is the effect of parasympathetic stimulation? It increases the sweating of palms of the hands. So as you can see here, there is no opposing action of sympathetic and parasympathetic system. It is not necessary that all the places the parasympathetic and sympathetic system has opposing action. Sometimes they have the synergistic action also. And sometimes as we will see in case of blood vessels, there is only action of one system and there is complete absence of the other. The blood, the blood vessels are supplied only by the sympathetic system whereas the parasympathetic uh, fibers are not at all there. So coming to the apocrine glands, the apocrine glands if it is sympathetic stimulation is present, apocrine gland will secrete thick odoriferous secretion. The apocrine gland if stimulated by sympathetic stimulation causes the secretion of thick odoriferous secretion whereas there is no effect of parasympathetic stimulation on apocrine glands. Now coming to the effect of sympathetic and parasympathetic system on the blood vessels. So <clears throat> most of the blood vessels are supplied by only the sympathetic nervous system. There is no or very little supply of parasympathetic nervous system. What does the sympathetic nervous system does? It causes most often the constriction of the blood vessels and it is done as we have seen earlier it is done by the alpha receptors whereas some beta receptors are also present if, if there is mild or if there is stimulation of beta receptors it might cause dilatation of the blood vessels also. So both the constriction and dilatation are due to the effect of sympathetic stimulation. If there is stimulation of alpha receptors which is the most or the major case it is causing constriction and rarely if the alpha is suppressed by some drug and then beta is acting then it causes the dilatation of the blood vessel through the beta receptors of adrenergic receptors. Coming to the heart muscles the sympathetic system increases the heart rate increases the force of contraction whereas the parasympathetic system it decreases the heart rate decreases the force of contraction especially of atria not that much of ventricles if there is a powerful parasympathetic stimulation it has the power that it can also stop the heart coming to the coronary vessels 
the coronary vessels are dilated by beta 2 receptors whereas constricted by the alpha receptors and the effect of parasympathetic system on coronary vessels is it dilates the coronary vessels so that is how sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation works on the blood vessels and the heart ultimately the outcome falls on the blood pressure also so it helps the sympathetic when we are exercising it helps to increase the outflow of the heart and it increase helps to increase the blood pressure whereas in between the rest in between is majorly facilitated by the parasympathetic system where it decreases the heart rate and decreases the force of contraction now coming to its effect on lungs the bronchus the bronchi and the blood vessels of the lung so sympathetic stimulation dilates the bronchi or dilates the respiratory passage it can be used as a drug in case of bronchial asthma to dilate or to relax the respiratory passage muscles and to dilate and facilitate the passage of air whereas the parasympathetic system constricts and makes the lumen of the respiratory passage small in case of blood vessels the sympathetic system mildly constricts the blood vessels of the lungs whereas the parasympathetic dilates the blood vessel of the lungs so the main action here is the sympathetic dilates the bronchi whereas the parasympathetic constricts the bronchi one more thing about lungs is it the sympathetic system decreases the secretion of the glands which are present on the respiratory passage whereas the parasympathetic stimulation increases the secretion of the glands which are present on the respiratory passage so in both ways sympathetic stimulation by decreasing the secretion and by relaxing the bronchi it is facilitating the passage of air whereas the parasympathetic system by increasing the secretion and by constricting the bronchi it is inhibiting or it is resisting the passage of the air to the lungs now coming to the intestine the gut what about the muscles smooth muscles we have already seen about the secretion of the gland now we are seeing about the smooth muscles which causes the movement of the gut the sympathetic system by its effect on the neurons which are present intramurally the intramural nervous system of the gi tract it affects the parasympathetic and sympathetic system affects the intramural nervous system of the gi tract and by its action sympathetic system decreases the peristalsis and increases the tone of the sphincter muscles the tone of the sphincter muscles and decreases the peristalsis in the lumen so it is decreasing the overall movement whereas the parasympathetic system increases the peristaltic tone and relaxes the sphincters that means it is stimulating the emptying of the lumen or it is causing the movement forward movement of the uh, bowel or the forward movement of the content of the lumen and emptying of the lumen so sympathetic it contains the or it resists the movement whereas the parasympathetic it facilitates the movement of the intestine now coming to the liver the metabolic effect on liver is it increases the glucose synthesis and glucose release from the liver the parasympathetic system it is also it is trapping the glucose that is slight glycogen synthesis glucose is converted into glycogen under the effect of parasympathetic system whereas under the sympathetic system glucose is released as we can see sympathetic system is activated during activity higher activity higher stress the body needs a more amount of glucose more amount of energy that is why it the sympathetic system stimulates the release of energy release of glucose into the blood gall bladder and bile ducts are relaxed that means in the activation in the effect of sympathetic system the gall bladder and bile ducts are not secreting their content outside whereas when parasympathetic 
system is activated they contract when they contract they secrete their secretions outside into the intestine with the help of bile duct this is the effect of parasympathetic system secreting outside or the sympathetic system it it inhibits the uh, pouring out of the bile juice by relaxing the gall bladder in the bile duct in kidney sympathetic system decreases the urine output and increases the renin secretion which then allows the body to contain or to uh, restrict the outflow of sodium and water excretion of sodium and water so sympathetic system decreases the urine output decreases the excretion of water and sodium whereas parasympathetic effect has no effect on kidney coming to the urinary bladder the detrusor and the trigon acts antagonistically the detrusor muscle is relaxed and the trigon is contracted this facilitates the keeping of the bladder content inside the bladder whereas when parasympathetic system is stimulated it contracts the detrusor and relaxes the trigon muscles which causes the micturition to take place contraction of detrusor and relaxation of trigon call will cause initiation and occurrence of micturition reflex whereas the sympathetic system is there to prevent micturition now coming to the blood vessels the systemic arterioles in the systemic arterioles abdominal viscera under the effect of sympathetic stimulation are the blood vessels to the abdominal viscera are con contracted or constricted why it is done because when the sympathetic system is activated more and more blood should flow to the muscle and that is why the abdominal viscera the blood flow to the abdominal viscera is decreased by contracting or constricting the blood supply there is very less or none effect by the parasympathetic system on all these things the blood vessels to the muscles are constricted by adrenergic whereas dilated by cholinergic and beta 2 adrenergic receptors so if there is action on the muscles the muscles will dilate causing more blood flow to the muscle the blood flow to the skin is also decreased by the sympathetic nervous system because there is constriction of the blood vessels by the sympathetic stimulation coming to the blood it increases the coagulation in the blood sympathetic nervous system it causes more amount of glucose and more amount of lipids to provide energy for the activity which is stimulating the sympathetic nervous system now coming to the last slide the basal metabolism is also increased by the sympathetic stimulation the adrenal medullary secretion is also increased the mental activity is also increased the piloerector muscles which straightens the hair is erected and skeletal muscle in the skeletal muscle sympathetic nervous system causes increased glycogenolysis and increased strength of contraction that means increased glycogenolysis glycogen is uh glycogen is break down to produce glucose to provide more energy in the muscles in the fat cells the sympathetic stimulation cause lipolysis that means the fat cells the adipocytes the fat cells releases the lipids inside the blood so that those lipids can be used as the uh, metabolites for production of energy and at last we are going to see the role of adrenal medulla in the sympathetic stimulation as we were seeing the splanchnic neurons which directly supplies the adrenal medulla stimulates the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla directly into the blood 80% of these secretions is epinephrine and 20% is norepinephrine the effect of these secretions last longer 5 to 10 times as long as compared to the direct stimulation by the sympathetic neurons the epinephrine and norepinephrine perform the same actions as together but epinephrine 
has more impact on the metabolic rate which increases the metabolic rate of the whole body. This adrenal medulla also provides a dual mechanism or the second pathway through which if there is uh, if there is any lag in the action of sympathetic supply by the neurons it can be fulfilled by the direct release of these neurotransmitters and acting directly on the receptors which are adrenergic receptors which are present on the organs with the help of these neurotransmitters released from the adrenal medulla so it also acts as a safety mechanism so that the sympathetic division of autonomic nervous system can be activated even by the secretion of adrenal medulla throughout the whole body in the next class we are going to study about the applied aspects of autonomic nervous system thank you so much